really, let's just get down to brass tacks. And I really loved one student's commentaries of saying, why do we keep talking about future problems with climate change when it is today? And that's so right. We have climate change effects right now. It is today. It is real. Um, beautiful question. How effective is protesting in changing climate policy? And I thought maybe that's a good place to start this wrap-up part of my lecture. We're going to do what we've been doing the last few weeks. I and John will be co-guest lecturers, if you will. We'll, we'll roam through some slides pretty quickly, and then we'll get into panel format, and you can um, ask us questions, and I have the pre-questions that you sent. Um, but how effective is it? And really, the North Dakota Access Pipeline is really a beautiful example, isn't it? Of it went from something that wasn't in the media at all, in fact, it looked like it was actually actively squelched, to where busloads of veterans were showing up to help, help out the protesters. And, you know, an effect has been had, at least stopping some actions, at least for a while. Uh, and we certainly all know silent acquiescence will not help anything. So. You know, it, sometimes it gets tempting to just go dark, but don't. It, it won't help anything. But I know for myself, I'm not much of a protester. I, I see where I add my value to this particular situation as playing to my strengths, which is teaching and working on engineering solutions. So that's my path. But if you're inclined to be a protester, I can't tell you much about how to make that work, but it does seem to have its effectiveness for sure. Um, Again, uh, I, love, I love the end of this book. Next, next year, should we be teaching this again? This will also be a required text along with Cold Cash, Cool Climate, Atmosphere of Hope by Tim Flannery. And you've now seen this every week because I love this. And because it really has resonated with you, I'm seeing in your notes. So it really is, you know, we have the tools and we really could do it if we had the political and civil will to do it. And right now it's up to us, you is us, <laughs> is we. We really have to do something about this, and we can. And the race for a better future, we can make that choice. And we've talked about what's, what's critical here. We started out saying science is critical to let us know what the situation is. Policy drives change. Engineering brings solutions. That's where we've been focused. But as we've gone through the quarter, we've seen various lectures from startups and funders and you know, solving impossible problems. And we've seen, well, we need a whole lot of other things too, right? The right market, the right business model. Pivot, figure it out. Funding, design thinking going to the end of what does the solution have to be, and then working your way back to how would I get there. Collaborations, remember to protect your IP and your financials. Um, remember we started lecture one with some things that illustrated how dire the situation is, and part of how we got there, right back in the, I think it was, yeah, 60s when this ran, an oil company was proud. Remember, we thought we were going into the next ice age. Proud that they could supply enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. And they were right. This is one time when advertising hyperbole, it was actually true. Um, but we're worried about sea level rise. We certainly are. We should be. And the costs are huge. Um, the jet stream shift, which has come about you know, in fair part, Perhaps, perhaps mainly driven by the ice melt in the Arctic, um, changing our weather, changing droughts, changing how cold things get, horrific storms. And remember, this, this is, these two slides that I'm going to spend a minute or two on is why we should never quit. There was one question, and I think it's from somebody who would never actually give up, but it's like, OK, it's bad. Why don't we just quit? And the reason is that every single degree is worth fighting over. If you're hearing people saying, well, we're never going to make the two degree limit, so it's all over, that is so wrong. And remember, with policy, we have more, much more of a chance, according to these MIT projections, of being at two and a half degrees C or lower than we do with no policy, where it looks like we have a half 50 50 chance of being above five degrees C. Why does that matter? Because there is a world of difference when you're up around four to five degrees C extinction of more than 40% of known species. When you're down around one degree C, you know, a little less, we're saying 
an increased risk for 20 to 30 percent of known species. It's just every degree that you, these are from the IPCC 2007 uh, uh, conclusions that Terry Root and a graphic artist put together to illustrate this. Remember, every degree is worth fighting over and fighting for. So please, for heaven's sake, don't give up. Um, but this is how I felt when I first got it, right? It's like, oh, the truck is coming. The children are dying. I'm in trouble. And, and it was paralyzing, right? But if we can take positive action, really positive action, well-reasoned positive action, that helps a lot. And so to roam through the first lecture, just to review that, so I and Armin Nuckermans um, gave an intro and talked about geoengineering. And I have to put in the word there of things are pretty dire for hitting the right targets of temperature rise given the mm, speed with which uh, sustainable solutions are not being adopted. Let's put it that way. It's slow, right? And so we're thinking if you want to do something to accelerate your ability to cope with these changes and maybe moderate some of the effects, maybe geoengineering, but make sure they're well characterized. They won't do any harm. They'll be reversible, preferably localized with localized impacts that you can understand. And that geoengineering will not, I loved that a lot of you picked this up in your summary, won't fix the root cause problems, but it may give us less damage while the world gets to where the world needs to get with long-term solutions for sustainable. And you know, geoengineering isn't a new thought. This is back in 1976, and there was this public law enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives that weather-related disasters and hazards, including drought, hurricanes, tornadoes, blah, 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 result in a lot of suffering, and therefore weather modification technology has significant potential. They were really, they were thinking in what may have been more bold than wise ways, but they were thinking about this back then, which is really interesting. The other thing I would say is that there were a couple of really good questions. Why not keep geoengineering work quiet so people don't count on it? Frankly, that's what I did the first several years when I was working on this. It's like, if, if people got wind that there might be an out, then we just keep on the same path that we are and we get into worse trouble. Because as you're moderating some of the effects as geoengineering will, you're not fixing the root problem. And it just makes it, you, you can back things up away, as Steve Schneider told me when I first presented this to him and Terry Root, you can back it up a little way, but it's not gonna go back by the same path. It's gonna put unanticipated pressures on everything. So. So, so you don't want to have geoengineering be the solution and let's keep on with you know, our SUVs and, and you know, 10 miles a gallon and such. But if you keep it quiet at this point where it looks like some of it may really be needed, you don't want it to be in the dark and somebody suddenly says, okay, I've got the solution, here it is, and they put it out there in the world without any chance for public scrutiny. It's got to be. It's got to be scrutinized. People have to have a chance to weigh in on what are the problems, the possible problems. What are the pros and cons? If you are bold enough to think that your solution may, may have less risks than some other solutions, it seems to me it's your duty to get that out there. There may be this other choice that you might not be aware of so that people can weigh the right actions, the right choices with all of the information available. And it's really hard to get funding if it's secret. So it's really, um, so I think it's a lovely question and I went that way at first thinking, yeah, I'm not sure it'll work and mm, I don't wanna be the excuse. But at this point, I don't think that's the right choice. Um, and then the, back again to the, should we give all, up all help, hope now? No, of course not. There's a world of difference between how dire things will feel and be between one, two, three, four, five degrees C range. Okay, um, so what I decided to take on, as you know, is slowing down the melt of the polar ice caps. And I think I have neglected to show you the 34 second video of, of how, this, uh, how this works, um, how, how the ice melt goes. I would rather give you the more up to date one if it's still up here. Uh, this is a really good uh, illustration so here's recent picture of what on earth does this mean? Remember, we've got bright ice melting, multi-year highly reflective ice melting, open ocean absorbing sunlight much better than, and, and almost no area in the summer to reflect sunlight anymore. 
But what does that mean, really? I mean, this is satellite imagery. What does that mean? And it means that that's a world of difference, isn't it? You've got a few chunks of bright multi-year ice, and you've got some very thin ice starting to form. And I'll show you our photos from Barrow, uh, a few more of what the ocean really looked like. And these were the predictions back in 2007, before we fell off the cliff in 2012 and are falling off even farther. 2016, we are at record low ice extent for this time of year. And remember, it's a feedback effect. When I started this, that was 20% of global temperature rise. Now it's a third. And so we have this simple mission and strategy to just use these materials that reflect sunlight, are wettable, allow evaporative cooling to try to slow ice melt by reflecting. I'm assuming most of you have seen this. By having something that we can control um, so that we can um, take care of it if we've overcorrected um, and we can argue over what's just right. And we've been, and, and so the, the technique then is we, we float something or we put it on young ice and we reflect sunlight. It's very, so over here, reflective material, ugh, reflecting sunlight, preserving ice and snow or conserving water, same tricks. And we've been doing field work because you can theorize about this all you want, but until you're out in the field testing it, prototyping, failing fast forward, all the things you hear about a startup pivoting quickly, until you're in the field and testing it, you don't really know what's going to go right and wrong. We have learned a lot. Um, we're operating as a nonprofit because saving the Arctic doesn't turn out to be a very good business model so far. Um, in Barrow, just a few weeks ago in November, this is what the ocean looked like, hardly frozen. And as uh, one of my colleagues typified this, this was like looking at a slushy beginning to freeze up a little bit. You could see the water getting a little bit thicker, but it was still certainly not ice. And it was having chunks come gradually into shore to build up a very unstable uh, bit of ice and a few chunks out there farther away, but it really, this was an interesting trip that way. Um, there I am, <laughs> right, <laughs> with my cow hat, forgive me. Um, you, you really, uh, it wasn't as cold as it should have been. <laughs> you your parka. <laughs> well, I did borrow one finally. <laughs> That's my ski jacket. Um, and there we were in the hangar just getting, you know, it's all about engineering details. If what you're trying to do is get the data, to be able to prove your technology out and demonstrate it and be able to feed it in models and be able to show the world what the pluses and minuses are. There is so much instrumentation you have to do. There's Satish, who you may remember guest lecturing with us. Um, there are, oh, Satish and I think one of the Inupiat uh, Eskimo uh, Native, Native Americans who were helping us out there, um, at, which is required up there. Here's what the young ice that had just formed on this lake look like as opposed to snow, right? Young ice is very, very dark. Um, here we were just scraping it around, getting things set in so that we could set our buoy up. What an ice hole looked like as soon as we, we drilled through, it wasn't very thick, lots of water. And then just what it's like to do this at a time of year when it's two hours of sunlight, they say, two hours of daylight, but what they don't tell you is this incredible twilight colors for hours and hours on either side of it. There's part of our team there, again, uh, Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, with, with some of our, he was acting as our polar bear guard uh, this time too. Uh, we didn't see a polar bear. And you know, it's, it's big out there. You, you think you're doing something and you're in the tiny speck in this vast space at this point. And there was our, our buoy, one of our data buoys that the guys had set up. And then we've been in Minnesota where we've been doing testing for years because we are in his backyard and he is really handy with tools and really passionate about this project. And what we were doing here was, uh, and with one of the same coworkers from the Arctic, what we were doing here was segmenting the pond so that we can get as good data as possible with another colleague. We just, you know, you gotta just work so hard to get it right. And it always seems to go into dark. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's what the real on the ground, on the, in the field things that we're doing are. And I, I have to say, frankly, it's fun too when you're working with something that you are really passionate about and that you think can make a real difference. You have a surprising amount of fun while you're getting little sleep and blah, 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 right? It, it's actually pretty great. And I wanted to, I've got just two more slides here, I think. Um, 
I wanted to say that we in this room share a set of superpowers that may not be obvious to you as you wonder if you should give up. We've all got education, intelligence, perseverance. We care. John started to go through the rest of the list, you know, diligence. We know how to follow, right? You could name the virtues that you know that you have by virtue of being here or by virtue of caring enough to be watching this online. And so if not us, who's going to take this on? And if not now, when, right? I, I know that's not original with me, but it's very relevant. So I wanted to say, before I close, this isn't quite the, uh, quite the order I thought I had. I wanted to say, as we went through the quarter, we went through many talks that touched on policy, which is critically important, and startups. And John's book is all about right the many entrepreneurial ways you're going to fail forward, figure things out, get them figured up. Of course, if we said funding, we'd have the same thing with another couple, solving impossible problems. There's more. And what I wanted to ask you all in just a lightning round, if you guys will dare to speak out, somebody, anybody on each of these lines, say one thing you learned. Because I know from your summaries, you've learned a lot. So what did you learn from the first one? This can go quick if you just blurt it out. Anybody? Seriously? Cool. Um, we could have the same person on the next one if we didn't. <laughs> what about the trip to the water recycle plant? A lot of you really love that. Yeah. Oh, There's information in your waste. Wasn't that cool? They were saying that they could warn the clinic about oncoming need for, for medicine because you could tell in advance of when a flu epidemic was coming. Uh, yeah, wild. Huh? What about Brent Constance? CO2 mineral mineralization. You can make useful products from carbon dioxide. Yep. Uh, what about uh, the Tesla co-founders, Mark and Martin? What did you learn that could help you in your entrepreneurial endeavors? Design products for the rich. <laughs> That's what they did. Just start. Just start. Yeah, yeah, they did that because they knew why every other one had failed. And it was just every other EV company had failed because they didn't do that. Right. Learn from other people. Uh, Doug and Satish are polar instrumenters and explorers, bipolar as it were. Some people are really tough. <laughs> Gosh, isn't that the truth? <laughs> what about Julio? Uh, sorry, yes, Julio. And, uh, and then the phantom Kate, unfortunately, couldn't make it. She, uh, she, she really wanted to be here. Um, what did you learn from there? Coal can actually be really clean and important. Say again? Coal can actually be really clean and important to our future. Yeah, wasn't that interesting? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, Nancy and Rex. Show me the money. The idea that profit only comes at the expense of social good is a myth. It's not true. Beautifully put. Yes. Isn't that nice? What about Kimberly? Take it on the impossible tasks. Well, what I learned from Kimberly, I've got to say, was this: these studies on what makes a good leader, I found really interesting. Um, Forward-looking, inspiring, vision, honest, you know, really outweighed. I don't think messy handwriting, which is my own bane, even made the list. It was something anybody would care about, right? It was, how do you actually lead people? And do you guys remember the, the secret four words that you say to somebody to actually begin to let brainstorming occur? Interesting. Tell me more. Yeah and how that just opened up the conversation and the possibilities. And I loved reading your write-ups where you were saying, I didn't think we could possibly do this. But then we started at the end, you know, envision the solution. And then we started, and I'm convinced now we could. Said, yes. Um, what about just uh, last week, Rocco, David, and Deepti? Anybody? What's going to help you go forward in your entrepreneurial endeavors or your lives? Oh, please. It's the last one I'm asking you. <laughs> what really now learns to live a more living way. They got a phenomenal resource in that center over the LBL, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that was quite incredible, wasn't it? And these guys are so super. I mean, Rocco and David, their superpower is collaboration. And here they found one more that's just working for them to, to pull this out in the world. Hopefully, you will have something very inspiring that you're learning from Dr. Kumi. Um, this is my very last slide, and it's saying, really, I, I put this class together with the hope that it's going to help you learn how to pursue and implement really good ideas and projects to help with climate change. And you're going to have course evaluation forms to fill out. And please do fill them out. It'll let me know. It'll let Stanford know how we did with this. OK, so thank you. And now we're going to turn it over to John. Do you want me to try to get your slides open here? All right. OK, so I'm told I have 20 minutes. So I might cheat and take a little more than that, but we'll see. Leslie asked that I review some of the motivation for understanding this problem and then talk mostly about entrepreneurial challenges and where I think the opportunities lie for people who want to make a difference in this space. A lot of this will be review, so I'll go quickly. We know from the National Academy of Sciences and all the IPCC reports that the Earth is warming. Humans are responsible. One of the biggest forcing agents for warming is, of course, emissions of carbon dioxide. And this shows you the fossil fuel century. This is starting in 1850, showing fossil fuels, land use change, and cement, the net contributions to uh, carbon emissions over time. So exponential growth for much of that period. That growth in emissions has led to a huge jump in CO2 concentrations from fossil fuels and land use changes. And this is plotting the last 800,000 years of carbon dioxide concentration. So they take the bubbles in the ice cores and they can actually trace back and measure just how much CO2 there was. You see that there's this range between about 180 and about, I think the highest is about 300 uh, parts per million by volume over the last 800,000 years. But in the last century plus, we've pushed the Earth's atmosphere well outside the comfortable range in which humanity developed and, and civilization was created. And uh, this is really an unprecedented change, as you can see, in the last 800,000 years. Here's the last 12,000 years, and you see relatively stable concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. Yes? So humans, modern humans, uh, I don't know, I don't think anyone knows exactly, but I think it's around 100,000 years ago. Wow. Okay, so in terms of civilization, you know, the first parts of civilization that we're able to identify, 10, 12,000 years, right? So we've had a, a period of remarkable climate stability over this, for, for as best we can tell from our measurements. And here's what we've done to carbon dioxide concentrations. As, as you've probably seen from the news, that now we're just over 400 parts per million, at 405, I think, something. It goes up and down during the course of the year. But this is a pretty substantial shift out of that uh, comfortable temperature range. Here's what happens when you start putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So this is a reconstruction of temperatures uh, using proxy methods and direct measurements over the last 12,000 years, and relatively stable temperatures, but then you see this jump as uh, we approach the modern time. Now, we know everyone thinks that you know, these changes, they seem small, one Celsius, two Celsius, uh, it's 1.8 Fahrenheit per degree, uh, Celsius degree. Uh, the reason why this is a concern is because of the distribution of temperatures. What you're doing when you raise the temperature is not just changing an average, you're shifting the distribution. So what we used to think of as extreme hot weather or hot weather can occur many times more frequently as you shift the distribution even a small amount. And that's the source of concern. The, the extremes that come about from these shifts come about because we're shifting the distribution over. Now, there's actually data on this. Hansen uh, did this number of years ago, and you can see <coughs> the distributions plotted for the northern hemisphere over a set of uh, periods, so 1951 to 81, 
as a baseline, 81 to 91, 91 to 2000, one and 2001 to 2011. And what you see from this is not only is the distribution shifting, but it's, it's flattening and spreading. So those extremes that you see in temperature as well as uh, precipitation are, are coming about broadly across the world. This is, not, this is something that we can measure and it's something that's worrying. So the damages that come from changes in climate are not primarily focused on the average change but focus on the extreme changes. Now, if that weren't worrying enough, this is what happens if we don't do anything. So I, I relied in the book on a no policy case that MIT did in 2009. Uh, this shows what would happen if you followed that no policy case over time to 2100 in terms of the concentration. So you saw we had this big jump in the last 12,000 years, but we're talking about a very much larger increase in the concentrations by 2100, so over 900 parts per million CO2. Now, of course, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. So in the MIT uh, scenario, they included other gases. And what they showed in their no policy case was uh, an increase in the carbon dioxide equivalent concentration by 2100 of, of over 1300 parts per million. It's about 4.8 times pre-industrial concentration. So it's more than two doublings of greenhouse gas concentrations in that very, very short period. So you're saying you're including methane? Yes, yeah, so here's the, here's the breakdown, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and then other gases and, and warming agents. And this doubling, I put it in terms of, uh, I put it in terms of a doubling, and the reason why we do that is because the climatologists traditionally measure the sensitivity of the climate to warming by thinking about how much the climate will warm for a doubling of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas concentrations. So one doubling typically would result in an equilibrium temperature change of about three Celsius. If you have two doublings or more, then you're talking about five or six Celsius, and that's a very substantial shift in temperatures. So this is what that means using that same historical data, but then applying the temperature changes uh, from the MIT study. Now, and of course, this is not the equilibrium temperature change because 100 years isn't long enough to have all of those changes manifest. So we're talking about at least six Celsius beyond uh, pre-industrial times. And that's not even including some of the, the feedbacks related to melting ice faster than we thought we would and, and so on. So it's a huge, huge problem. And civilization, I don't think, can survive six Celsius. I think it is, it, there's no way that this, because we depend on so much of these life support systems. I, I, you know, people will still survive. Some creatures will survive, but it will be a disaster. Now, people who have been working on this for a long time have tried to find safe boundaries. And the thing that's been talked about a lot is the two Celsius warming limit. Uh, most of the more recent work shows that even that is probably not completely safe, but as Leslie said, two is better than three and three is better than four. So the best we can do is, is to get the, keep the temperature as low as we possibly can. Yeah, there may be, the, yeah, there are these tipping points that can come. So there's a lot of potential dangers here. Uh, there's a guy named Weitzman at uh, Harvard who has done a bunch of work on what he calls the long tails of risk the tipping points, the things that might lead to big disasters. And the models that the economists use basically ignore that. And he tried to, he's an economist, he tried to include that in his analysis. So one of the realities though that people need to understand is that fossil fuel scarcity will not save us. Even if you believe in peak oil, which I do not, uh, it's not gonna help us. And the reason is that there are so many fossil fuels on the earth that even if we burn a small fraction of them, we will destroy the climate. So I show here the fossil resource base based on the, the global energy assessment in 2012. That's everything that we th know exists and think exists. The conventional resource base doesn't include some of the things like methane hydrates and other uh, more exotic uh, fossil fuels. And then I show what's called proven fossil reserves. Those are the reserves that we can we believe we can extract using current technology at current prices. 
So those are pretty well known. And you can see the no policy case only burns the proven fossil reserves and a tiny part of the fossil resource base. So fossil fuel constraints will not save us from this problem. So what the heck are we gonna do? Always have to have a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon in here. Critically important. Okay, so as uh, John Holdren, uh, who was my professor at Berkeley years ago, uh, likes to say, we have three options in dealing with climate. We can adapt, we can suffer, and we can mitigate. To adapt means that we make human systems more resilient and flexible. Suffering means accepting what comes, but what comes is likely to be extremely costly for humans and the environment. Mitigation is what I focus on mostly because the more mitigation you do, the less adapting and suffering you need to do. We're gonna do all, some of all of these three things. The more mitigation we do, the less adaptation and suffering we'll do. So the questions always come about mitigation options. How much carbon will they save? How much will they cost? Are they feasible? You've all probably seen this curve. This is kind of the standard curve in economics. Uh, benefits and costs for reducing emissions, the avoided incremental damage costs fall as you move towards reductions of impacts, the abatement costs rise as you move towards uh, zero emissions, and there's a point where they cross, which is the so-called least cost optimum. This is kind of the standard approach. The problem is that this approach assumes that we can actually calculate what the cost of these options are or the cost of damages are 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. And that is just wrong. We cannot do it. There's no way to predict these things. If you review the, the forecasting literature, as I and other colleagues have done, you see we haven't been able to do it in the past, but there are very good fundamental reasons to believe that we can't do that. We cannot predict the future with accuracy. Economic systems are different than physical systems. Physical systems have structural constancy. Economic systems do not. So this conventional model of uh, doing the full benefit cost analysis, figuring out what that optimal point is, and then taking action is completely inadequate for dealing with this problem. Instead, we need to start thinking in an evolutionary frame. We need to understand path dependence. We need to understand that there is actually no such thing as an optimal path, but there are a lot of possible paths that we could take. We can't plan or know everything about those paths, but we can use that warming limit, whether it's one and a half or two C, as a way to define success and then decide whether we're acting fast enough to be able to, to solve this problem. So one of the fundamental realizations when you realize the world is path dependent is that our choices now affect our options later. So the things we do now in terms of deployment will allow us to learn and reduce costs and uh, accelerate emissions reductions. So this curve, the standard curve that the economists use, it assumes constant or decreasing returns to scale. So you don't have economies of scale, you don't have learning effects. But in the real world, learning effects are pervasive. That's one of the main drivers of path dependence. So learning effects are our friends in this. Now to survive in this environment, to do well in it, you need to invest in a lot of different options. You need to fail fast, fa fail forward fast. I'm gonna use that, that's really good. Uh, modify your plans dynamically, learn as fast as we can. This is what the National Research Council calls iterative risk management. When you can't actually predict with accuracy, you need to act, see what happens, and then change what you're doing if it's not working. So the warming limit you've heard about, uh, defining that warming limit, one and a half or two C, of pre-industrial times, figure out how much we can emit to stay under that limit, define the pathways that meet that constraint. It turns out those pathways are pretty tightly constrained at this point. We've dilly-dallied for so long that we don't have a whole lot of options here. And then we need to figure out what we need to do to achieve that pathway. How many power plants do we need to build? What rate of improvement in energy efficiency do we need and so on? And then we try things, we fail fast, and we alter course as needed. Now, this is a picture of what happens when you wait, and there are some foolish people who argue that we should wait and see. Bjorn Lomborg is among those kind of people. Uh, the problem is that with this problem, you're dominated by cumulative emissions. 
So if you wait, what you're doing is locking in infrastructure and you're locking in damages. And you're, if you wait, you're going to have to reduce emissions even faster later. So there's no benefit. If, if, we, if technologies and energy moved as fast as computers, maybe there'd be some logic to this, but they don't. So it's just a moot point. The more you wait, the harder it's going to be. And the more infrastructure you build, the harder it's going to be. If you build them and they're generating profits, politically it's even harder to, to turn them off. It's easier to stop them before you build them. So there's no time to waste. The cumulative emissions are the area under these different curves, and it just uh, makes the problem harder the longer you wait. So working towards this limit is like strategic planning for big companies. It's not forecasting. And the people who work in big companies, they know you can't do this kind of forecasting, but you need to say, I'm going to build a plant that's this big and produce this much by this date. And they figure out what they need to do to get there. So this is a way of organizing our thinking about solutions to the problem. Now, this is a similar graph to the resource graph that I showed you, the fossil resource base compared to proven reserves, compared to the no policy case. The safer climate case which gives us about a two-thirds chance of hitting the 2C limit, means we have to keep even the majority of proven fossil reserves in the ground, or you have to figure out a way to safely store the emissions from burning those fuels. So it's a very substantial challenge. So let me turn to some of the lessons for entrepreneurs. That was kind of like drinking from a fire hose. I apologize, but uh, it's important for motivating the urgency of uh, tackling this problem. So one of the, th the first lessons that uh, you learn about when you start to focus on this is to think not about energy, but about tasks. To understand what people are doing with energy, and then to figure out new ways to do the same thing using a lot less energy. And uh, if you think about a material that's uh, made of some uh, calcium and some other things that's very hard. You could make that in a, uh, a, a furnace that's a very high energy thing, or you could feed a chicken, and the chicken will make the eggshell for you at, at room temperature. So you get the same end result of this immensely hard material, but doing it in a very different way. If you think about the task, you might come up with that idea, or use it copying the, the way the chicken does it. But if you think about an energy system and say, well, my job is to make that furnace more efficient, you're going to be constrained. Because you might be able to make it 10%, 20% more efficient. But if you totally rethink the process from the ground up by thinking about the whole system, you can make dramatic breakthroughs. Another important lesson is that time is money. And one of the things in modern societies that you find, as particularly as you get older, as you have kids, is that time is probably the most important thing you have. And as you get wealthier, you're willing to pay to give yourself more time. And the problem is that uh, if you try to focus on just energy, you're going to, I think in, in many cases, you're going to end up at a dead end. So a lot of people, I, I worked on a startup that uh, was attempting to, to give advice to homeowners about energy. And we had what I thought was a good business model, and we ended up developing a recommendation engine, analyzing people's uh, options and so on for residential customers. We were about three weeks from getting acquired by Google. We had the, we, this was like 2008, right? So around the bad time of the financial crisis. And we had, fi I think, cracked the code for this. But the hard thing about it is that you, when you're dealing with very small dollar numbers for the energy use in, in households, it's very hard to make a business out of that. And so that's something you need to think about is where's the money? And one of the things that where the money is is in people's time and rich people's willingness to pay and you know, middle class people's willingness to pay to give them a little more time with their family. And that turns out that time is something is much more valuable to people than your modest expenditures on fuel for heating your house because it's really not a whole lot of money. Um, another lesson that comes from thinking deeply about economic models and systems is that property rights turn out to be a key leverage point. 
So in all those economic models where they talk about how hard it's going to be to reduce emissions, they hold property rights constant. So that means that there's no innovation in the way property rights are defined. So here's an example of how property rights can change the game. So when uh, people defined water rights and mineral rights for uh, different countries, they said, okay, we're going to split off the mineral rights. So when you buy land, you, you actually, you may or may not be buying the mineral rights under that land. You may or may not be buying the water rights. Those are separable things. Well, what they've started to do, and, and Jane Woodward has been a great innovator in this, is to take the rights to the wind above certain land and sell that off as a separate thing. And so what that means is that it allows people to get capital, and this is happening in the farming communities uh, a great deal now, it allows people to get capital to build wind turbines and give money to those farmers. But before they defined those rights, it was a lot harder to get the financing to do it. Another example is uh, for battery powered devices, like this one. Uh, in the olden days, uh, you were, when you bought it, you were responsible for disposing of that battery when it was done. But in Europe and some other places, they've started to do what's called extended producer responsibility. They've said, okay, you manufacturers, you're responsible for bringing that battery back and getting it recycled. So in essence, they, they're selling the battery, but the manufacturers are still forced to hold on to the property rights in the disposal of the battery. So again, this is an innovation in property rights that can change the game. And all those economic models that talk about how hard it is to do something about emissions, they just assume that there's no innovation in property rights, which is absolutely wrong. It's not something that we're going to be doing a whole lot more of that stuff. Now, I, I particularly am interested in focusing on information technology for data collection, uh, substituting bits for atoms. So if you can, uh, you know, instead of sending yourself overseas, you use video conferencing, uh, using smarts instead of parts. So substituting an electric vehicle, you're getting smarter about what parts you're using, what parts you're not using. Uh, redesigning systems so you don't need to use certain parts, and then using IT to transform institutions to make them a whole lot more efficient. In all of this, we're working forward toward goals. So same thing like with the 2C limit, we figure out what we need to do to get to that goal. The same thing is for any of these uh, innovations that you want to think about. You need to think about, okay, here's the goal I want to get to. How am I going to get there? and building up a business case that will allow you to get there. So for whole systems, it's important to think about every part. And in the early days when we did these studies of emissions reductions, we almost always took the business as usual case projections of how much natural gas would be consumed, how much oil would be consumed, how much electricity would be consumed. Then we, we pretty much kept those constant. And within electricity, we figured out how you could be more efficient or how you could shift the generation of that electricity. But what's happened in the last five years is that some people are realizing that if you look at the whole system and start to shift some of the uses towards electricity, where we have a lot more options for reducing emissions on the generation side, you can actually achieve much greater reduction. So by looking at the, at the whole system, you can make a, a huge difference. Um, this, uh, the, the scenarios here you see, E3 is this uh, deep decarbonization scenarios. Those involve a lot of this electrification. Whereas uh, the renewable energy futures projection from NREL, the reinventing fire case from uh, RMI, that's pretty much status quo, business as usual sort of projection. So electrification can have a huge effect. So here's uh, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, we did some work on the historical trends and efficiency of computing. Uh, first published this work in 2011. What we found was that the energy efficiency of computing at peak output doubled uh, every year and a half from the 1940s to about 2000. And that's about a hundred fold improvement every decade. It basically enabled the smartphone in your pocket. It pushed us into this really interesting new design space. Since 2000, uh, the trend has, uh, has actually slowed, so we're now at about doubling every 2.6 years. Uh, but it turns out there's innovations on standby and low power modes that uh, 
actually uh, are accelerating beyond what the, the uh, peak outputs. So here's, this is a fun calculation I did taking those trends, projecting them out, and comparing them to a theoretical calculation that Feynman did back in 1985. He said, well, let's assume a three-atom transistor. Here's where you get to. And that would place us at the limit in about 2042. 2041, sorry. And that was just his thought experiment, but uh, back at uh, researchers at Purdue, the university, not the chicken company, uh, found, and the University of New South Wales had already created a reliable one atom transistor. So there's potential for moving well beyond this, but uh, right now the interesting thing is focusing on ways to improve the standby and off power for these devices because we're limited by the, the physics of our current devices at peak output. So peak output isn't everything, but idle is, turns out to be pretty important. Now, why do I care about these efficiency trends? Well, they enable all sorts of cool innovations. So here's the big belly trash compactor. Most of you have probably seen these. Uh, what they do is they have a photovoltaic panel on top. They have a uh, very simple communication technology that sends a signal that says, I'm full. And then the trucks can decide how to do their routing every day based on which one is full or which one is two-thirds full. So it sends a text message. So very low amount of data, but a very high value use of data. And what you're doing then is allows you to optimize the routing. So instead of always going to every can, you could just go to the cans that are full. And that, so what you're doing is you're substituting bits for atoms. You're thinking about what you need to do and using information, a tiny amount of information, to generate the same service, but at much lower environmental cost. Now, these trends have also led to incredibly low power sensors. So uh, my friend Josh Smith at the University of Washington has created a device that uses 60 microwatts on average. And that device can actually scavenge enough power from radio and TV signals if it's within five or 10 kilometers of a big TV tower to operate. So that allows you then to operate continuously without any other source of power. So that's a, an example of how getting into this new design space then allows you opportunities to do things that you couldn't uh, otherwise do. And there's, there's even fun things that are related to uh, medical devices. There's a company that creates a pill that you p it, it actually has, it has no battery. It has a cathode and an anode. You put it in your, in your, uh, in your stomach and then when it gets to your stomach, the stomach acids, acids are the electrolyte. And it sends a tiny signal to the patch on your skin that says, I took the pill at this time. Now, eventually, you could imagine it having other sensors. But the point is that there's no battery. There's no, the, the way it's created, it, it's basically this food product. It's got some, it might have some copper and some other things. But, uh, but it basically goes in your stomach, sends a signal. It turns out to be pretty important for certain patient populations. Did they take their medicine or not? Oh, we know, because it has been measured. So it opens up all sorts of possibilities. Here's another one from the University of Michigan. Very tiny, very low power. Uh, in th this case, they're using it to measure tumors. So again, you don't need to, to measure it every second or even uh, every minute. Uh, you can do it so that it measures it every 15 minutes or every hour. And if it's a fast growing tumor, you, that's all you need. And so again, this opens up the possibility of truly personalized medicine. But you couldn't do it without these improvements in the efficiency of devices. So here's Streetline Networks. Uh, there are other companies that do this as well. But uh, these are little uh, moats that are installed in parking spaces that actually say, are you in the, is there someone in the parking space or not? And it allows you then to, uh, to tell where the parking space might be. Because one of the big energy users for transportation is people driving around looking for parking. Now the total, sorry, go ahead. Here and say, this is, this is part of my world. This is, Martin Rolski was one of my colleagues when I was going through Berkeley Sensor and Actuator Center for my grad school. And this is the kind of stuff that we worry about in our buoys, our data buoys out there in the field, is yeah. how can we have with the lowest power getting our information out. So it's really interesting to 
see you looping That's, back to it's that. It's in the field now. Yeah. So, so another interesting thing about this is that the total power needed to do this, total electricity use, is really small. So for 40,000 parking spots in LA, they don't have all that coverage yet, but if you just extrapolate it to 40,000 uh, spots, the total power for all of those moats would be 15 watts. So this tiny amount of electricity, relatively small amounts of data, can allow you then to optimize this much larger system of cars driving around. So tons, many, many hundreds or thousands of tons of cars is being affected by a very tiny amount of electricity, a very small number of these moats. Okay, so I can summarize. Sorry, I've taken half an hour instead of 20 minutes, but that was a lot. Okay, so one of the things you learn when you talk to folks who work in, in business is that they, they already know that you can't predict the future. They don't have this hubris that the modelers have that you can somehow do that. Uh, this idea of working forward toward a goal that we use for the warming limit is also applicable to any other big strategic problem that businesses face. The focus in this world, where you're not trying to achieve optimality because you realize that's a false hope, is to focus on risk reduction, on experimentation, on evaluation, on innovation, and cost effectiveness, not on knowing the optimal path in advance. So this is what we call iterative risk management. Now, the science, when we first started looking into this question of the 2C limit, the science really pointed to that limit. It, it said, you know, in the last, you know, several hundred thousand years, this is the hottest that it has been, and the ice has been stable, and we haven't had major extremes. Um, ultimately, though, the choice that people make about whether that limit is the right one or whether it should be one and a half C is a political choice. It's a value choice, like all choices. Now, in this case, we're, we're declaring this value judgment up front. We're saying the 2C limit or the 1.5C limit, that's what we're shooting for. And we're going to do our best to get there. We may not get there, but we're going to do our best to get there. If you accept that that way of looking at this problem is valid, and that that limit is the one that you want to focus on, then you have to have very rapid reductions, and you have to keep most fossil fuels in the ground. Even if there's some carbon sequestration and storage, still most fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. And that's something that I think most of the politicians and people in the more status quo world haven't really come to grips with yet. They really do not understand it. And you saw it actually, uh, Trudeau, who's I think a you know, pretty decent guy overall in Canada, he said something like, I can't think of an example where a country that had all these fossil fuel reserves wouldn't develop them. And you think about that for a second, and you realize he doesn't get it. Because you're right, that's exactly the problem, and you can't do it, right? You cannot develop all these reserves. Most of them have to stay in the ground. And that's, the, that's what's called the collective action problem. You can't fix the problem individually. Any one country or group, you know, any one large country or group of countries can by themselves destroy the climate. So that's why you have to coordinate. That's why you have to uh, work together to constrain this. But uh, I think there's still there's a real inability of the political folks to get their head around this because they really, 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 really do not want to fight the fossil fuel industry. They keep looking desperately for ways not to have the conversation with the fossil fuel industry that says, you have to keep most of your reserves in the ground. They don't want to have that conversation. Because we're dealing with what may be the most powerful industry in the world. Uh, in cold cash cool climate, there's an appendix where I tallied what the revenue is from the fossil fuel industry. So oil and gas, coal, $5 trillion every year. For comparison, global tobacco, $500 billion. So 10 times bigger than the tobacco industry. So that's what we're dealing with here. And that, I think the politicians are really scared. But at the end of the day, Physics doesn't care about the politicians. Physics doesn't care who we elected president. Physics doesn't care about any of that. All it cares about is how much greenhouse gases, how many greenhouse gases have you put in the atmosphere? Because that's what's going to determine the temperature of the climate. So we can't just wait. There's no such thing 
as wait and see with this problem. We are done. I started working on this problem in the late 1980s. We did the first comprehensive analysis of a 2C warming limit in 1989. So this is not new information. The issue is how do we create the will to make these rapid reductions? And the important thing as an entrepreneur to think about is that you don't have to care about the status quo. You don't have to care about that $5 trillion revenue from the fossil fuel industry. Your job is to make that number go to zero. That's what your goal is. So that's why you have to look, you have to use whole system design, you have to look for improvements that are not 20% better, but a factor of 10 better or 100. And so that's the, that's the kind of shift that you need to go, go have in your brain. You need to start thinking about, how can I make a big difference? How can I really change the game? And because you're not in a big company, you don't have to worry about those revenues going away. Your job is to make those revenues go away for that, for that company. So another important insight, of course, is that we need to learn. But the only way you learn, or one of the, one of the most powerful ways to learn, I should say, is that uh, you learn by doing. And you only learn by doing if you do. And that's why you need to implement. That's why you need to deploy technologies as fast as we possibly can. We have a lot of options. And that's something, again, that I think is very poorly understood. Most, we, we, can, we can achieve very substantial reductions, 80 plus percent using on-the-shelf technology. We're still going to have to learn some things. Some R&D will absolutely be helpful. But we are at the stage where we can do that. It's been true for a while. The question is whether we'll decide to do that. And I'll leave you with that one. What, what did you say? I'll leave you with this one, which is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Alan Kay. So we'll end up with a few minutes of panel discussion. If people want to grab some more refreshments to help fuel their questions, please do. And uh, it's interesting being a panel of two. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Um, so huh, what was the best one that we wanted to say from here? What, yeah, I like this one. What part of the climate solution are you most excited about in terms of entrepreneurship, innovation, and scaling in the next 10 years? Well, I think it came out in the, in the presentation. I'm, I think information technology has a huge role to play yeah. in this because it, it, leverage, it allows us to leverage small amounts of information to affect big flows of energy, big flows of materials. Yeah. And if it's applied in the right way, it can actually have huge impact on the way the economy uses resources and, and generates emissions. Yeah, and that was a beautiful thing of saving so many miles of cars driving around by telling them, where, where are the parking spots? Where are they not? Right, and these little yeah. moats, they're about, right. you know, they fit in your hand. They're pretty tiny. They can have a huge effect. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so funny. I mean, that, that's, that's the other thing I work on is MEMS, <laughs> microelectromechanical systems. Yeah. It's right there. Um, are there burning questions from here? Because we've, we've answered some of these if we've gone along. But um, for instance, auditors never have a chance to submit their questions. You got any burning questions before we go back to these? OK, we're, we're answering it all. I love this one. If you were to start over at Stanford as a student, where would you focus your time and energy and studies and why? And I'll say for myself, I would have taken some business classes. I've had to learn it all on, on the ground, you know, boots on the ground. <laughs> and that would have been awfully handy because it turns out entrepreneurial solutions do seem to be the ones to go after. Yeah, so that's one of the things about entrepreneurship too is that it's inherently interdisciplinary. So if you're just taking classes in engineering, I think you're missing the boat. And I love engineering. It's great fun. But there are business classes, there are classes in earth systems, there are, there are all sorts of different ways to expand your mind and expand your skills. And you can learn then how to work with other people. Because I think one of the most valuable things in business is to understand how to work with people from a completely different discipline and communicate with them. So that I came from uh, the Energy Resources Group at that university that's like over at Berkeley over there. And that was my grad, graduate work. And I came, the Energy Resources Group is an interdisciplinary program. It's 
it's one of the very few. Iper is now, you know, the, uh, one of the, another one that's very well known. Um, but but that's a pretty rare thing. And if you're in engineering, you're going to need to to seek out those opportunities to communicate with other people in business, in you know, software engineering. If you're not doing that, materials, whatever else, you want to have the ability to work with many different kinds of people, and then you'll be successful at whatever you do. I like that. Leslie, can I build off of that? Just sort of that kind of <laughs> standard career question. Um, but uh, I'm actually going to struggle to, to phrase this as a question because it's more of a worry. But, uh, you know, we, we learned in the, um, the class um, with Nancy Fund that like, the VC industry is uh, horribly set up for, for clean tech. Um, and because it's so capital intensive yeah, and long so return. Yeah, and you know a lot of good companies have failed, um, and so like this, uh, the problem is so urgent. My my worry is like you know you could, uh, as a student right out of Stanford, go join a startup, start your own thing, but you're probably going to fail, and so the chance of having an impact as measured in terms of I don't know coal plants closed or emissions reduced is. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is on a risk-adjusted basis um, versus like should you join um, a medium-sized company or or a utility or the United States government like where mm. uh, you know how do you think about that kind of where can you personally have the most yeah. personal impact? Yeah. 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 So I think part of it is deciding the the kind of problem that you're good at solving, and I agree that the startup space is really risky. Most of them fail. It's just. That's the nature of things, right? And so you have to figure out a way that you can use your skills to get the highest impact. And in a medium-sized company, small to medium-sized company that is growing rapidly, that can be a pretty good place to make a huge difference because they don't have time to worry about whether you have every single skill that you need to do something. They're just gonna say, we need someone to do this. You're smart, go do that. And so, the small to medium companies are also already generating revenue, right? And so that, so, so sustainability is not just about emissions. Sustainability is actually about profits too. Because if you're not generating profits, you can't continue, right? So that's another kind of lesson from the business world. And it's important to understand that just creating something that is low emissions is not enough. You need to figure out a way that people will see so much value in that that they will give you money for it. You have to create a business model for it. And I think that a lot of people, I, I get a lot of people coming to me and saying, oh, I have this great idea for you know, measuring power use in data centers or you know, whatever. So that, that's an example where that's great, but you know, the real problems in data centers are not about technology or measurement, they're about institutions. They're about having separate budgets for facilities and IT. If you don't fix that, it doesn't matter how good your technology is. So, so I think part of it is having a deep understanding of where the value is and then finding companies that get that and that you have skills that you can help them get that. And so I, I would, you know, it's, if you're able to, to do a startup and you think it's exciting, that's something you should, you should try. But And you will learn a lot. You will learn a lot. But I would, you know, I would... Make sure you really understand that business model and, uh, and believe that the dollar flows that they're going after are large enough and that the institutional issues that might impede you capturing some of those dollar flows are small enough or tractable enough that you can actually fix it. I just think there's a lot of people who underestimate, they, they think they have a good technology. Maybe they even have a great technology. But if they haven't figured out how to get people to pay for it, it's going to die. So that's why I think the main thing is figure out the business model. Make sure it makes sense to you. Make sure that the val like it's very hard in the residential space because the money flows for energy are tiny. People don't care when you're you, you got to get the kids to school. You don't have time to worry about twenty bucks over the course of a year on your utility bill. And so that's. I think I, I've, that's where I see the most people saying, oh, look at this. We can measure how much electricity your refrigerator uses. Okay, but that's not where the money is. Yeah, so. and we've had some great examples in here of companies that kept pivoting till they found a business model that worked. I mean, 
that is that is a challenge. Yeah, well, rarely do they start with the business model that works, That's right? right? Yeah. They kind so of they figure it out. Yeah, yeah, you're definitely going to figure it out as you go along. Um, your book is a collection of scientifically based advice for entrepreneurs looking to solve the climate problem. Can you talk a little bit about your own experiences as an entrepreneur in this space? Have you done your own startups, basically? And, and when did things go exactly right? And, and did you have more hope for humanity regarding this crisis? <laughs> okay, well, you can never give up hope. That's I agree part of with it. that. I agree uh, with that. So the thing about startups is that most of them fail. So I told you about Wattbot. That was the, the one that almost got taken over by Google. Mm, and that was you, That yes. went bad. And then uh, I actually have been advising uh, Lit Motors, which is a company that uh, has designed and developed technology for a two-wheeled, what they call an auto cycle, which is an enclosed motorcycle. Two wheels uses gyroscopes to stabilize so that if it gets hit by a car, it skids. And so they have a prototype, they have all, this, all these patents, they've gone a long way to getting to a technology that will work, but you know, takes the next step once you've gotten there is you need tens of millions of dollars to do a real polished prototype. And so that's, that's often a big hurdle for these kind of right. things. And so whether we get there, I don't know yet. Um, but it's, you know, it's been a great experience working with that team because they're doing something that no one's ever tried to do before. Mm. And so you always learn something. But you kind of have to expect that you're not going to succeed most of the time. And if, you're not, if your personality is not resilient in the face of failure, either fix that or figure out something <laughs> else to do. Because... <laughs> Um, somebody wanted to ask me what I think is the most promising avenue of solutions to the climate problem to pursue and push for in the policy space right now and in 10 and 20 years. Um, I am an engineer. I'm not a policy guy, but... You're not even a guy. What are you talking about? Generically. <laughs> generic. Um, but I, I really take to heart some of the comments that were from our guest lecturers earlier in this quarter about when you specify a specific policy, I think this was about EVs, electric cars, right? That if you're saying, oh, it's going to have to be this kind, that you can get it wrong and you can set things back. I think this was about a biofuels discussion. Um, if you're asking the, the central, you know, the, the, the US government or any other governmental body to say which technology is going to have the most positive effect on the climate, they might not get it right. I mean, it's, it's certainly obvious that, that one should drive towards reducing CO2 and methane emissions. That, that part, great. But specifying a technology, I'm not sure. Can I, but you're probably, Can I add to that? Yeah, please. Uh, because there's actually experience in this. You hear always people saying, oh, we don't want to pick winners. But there's experience in actually setting standards that don't pick winners. So yes. they have these standards for the energy efficiency yes. of devices. And those standards, they develop a test procedure, and then they say, here's how we measure efficiency. And then we say, we're going to set a standard that says efficiency has to be this much or better. And the manufacturers then have to figure out what technologies they will apply to get that efficiency or better. So you're not picking winners. You're setting a performance level. And that's the kind of thing that I think government is uniquely suited to do. And for the appliance standards and for the standards for automobiles, they have a cost benefit test where they say, you know, we're going to look at the technologies that we now know about, and then we're going to try to set the standard in a way that is feasible based on what we know. Almost always what happens, though, is that the industry is smarter. They figure out a way to do it better and cheaper and faster than what the initial a priori estimates indicated. And that's something that's a kind of general lesson from this literature is that mm -hmm. people are smart and innovative and they learn how to do stuff. And policy, I will say, maybe this was directed to me because of my frustration years ago about getting lead out of gasoline. And it's like, why did the EPA cave after we had it ready to get to market? You know, But then if the, if the standard changes, if the standard gets relaxed, the companies won't introduce it. So yeah, if you set the standard 
too leniently, then companies who have even better solutions aren't going to get them out right. there. Right. And what happens over time for the appliance centers is that they update them. There's a periodic update schedule. It's in the legislation. That's and smart. So each time, they, technology changes, so they get a whole lot better. And so when they first did the, the air conditioner standards, I think they set the, the uh, energy efficiency ratio at 10 or 12. And now they're up to 18 or 20 mm. because technology has just gotten... Fantastic. Better and better and, and better. And industry can probably count on then that it's going to get more and more. Exactly. So, so, so having the innovating. expectations yeah. set accurately, I think, is good. And then Perfect. you end up with people and institutions being smarter than what we thought initially. So while we're talking about government, what role do you see government funding playing in supporting for-profit energy and environmental ventures? What governmental challenges to such ventures do you foresee with the upcoming administration change? I would say focus on the state level. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because there are going to be states that will not stop. California is among them. California, Oregon, Washington, New York, Massachusetts. Uh, there will be you know, continued updates to renewable portfolio standards. And that's going to create issues. And there's probably, I, I assume, California is going to go back and say, we want to have our automobile, if they try to relax the federal standards, I bet California will go back and say, well, it's our right to set our own standards, so we're yes. going to do that. Yeah. And that has led to these periodic cycles where the state says we want to do that, and the manufacturers say, well, we don't want to have California, which is this huge portion of our market, different than the U.S. Please give us national standards. So that's happened several times now. Yeah, that's so, fantastic. Yeah. Well, if it works. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, how do you square the need to invest in a broad range of options, fail fast, learn fast, with the reality that many of the entities that need to act this way are slow-moving, conservative national governments and multinational corporations, not Silicon Valley startups? <laughs> you have to make them obsolete. You basically, that, this is the thing. Your job is to make fossil fuel companies obsolete. Mm. So in the olden days, people fought wars over salt because salt was the only way to preserve meat. Oh, man. But when refrigeration was invented, the demand for salt really went away, right? Was, I mean, or at least it fell such that you, know, you didn't need to be so concerned about it. We can buy it for a dollar in the supermarket. So the goal is to turn fossil fuels into salt. Use technology and institutional innovation to make people look at this dirty, mucky stuff and say, well, that's great for making petrochemicals because we're still going to need to do that even after we're done with emitting fossil fuels. But it's really not something we want to be messing around with. It needs to, we need to make combustion obsolete. Mm -hmm. So that's as entrepreneurs, that's your job is to make those fossil fuel companies obsolete. If you encounter someone who doesn't believe that climate change exists or that it's anthropogenic, What's the single strongest piece of evidence that you refer them to? For me, it's the 34-second video of doom that failed to come up there. The ice melt over season. It's, uh, if you didn't, if I haven't shown it in class before, um, it, it, okay, I did. And, so and it's on our Ice Night People believe website. weird things. 25%, there's a National Academy of Sciences survey, 25% of the people said that the sun goes around the earth. In the United States. So do I really want to be arguing with these people? Might Not those important. people. <laughs> well, but I think the, the most, if you encounter people who are coming at you with a lot of arguments, there's a great website called Skeptical Science, which lists, it actually tracks the arguments. So people send in things saying, oh, I saw this argument here, and it gets tallied. Oh, right. And so then they list all the peer-reviewed responses to those arguments, and you can see the Earth isn't warming, it hasn't warmed since 98, all those other fallacies all listed there. So that's an important resource. Uh, so I what think was its name again? The Skeptical, skeptical Science. science. And then the other thing to say is that we've known about climate change since the mid-1800s. Right. People, they figured out that gases with three atoms have this warming effect. That's just how it is. That's a quantum mechanical fact. Mm. And so that means that you know, people started measuring it. Tyndall and some of these other folks in the mid-1800s. Fourier first actually speculated about it in 1820. 
right? So this effect is that we've postulated and now measured from multiple different independent sources is based on some of the most well-established principles in physical science. And I just want to say to them, you know, well, I'm going to take away your cell phone because you, you can't <laughs> use, you none of this believe. would work <laughs> if the physical science wasn't working. Uh, so, you know, you have to pick your battles. You have to decide whether it's really worth arguing with certain people. Um, but, you know, at this point, I think only the cranks I think these people are cranks. The people who are the the people who actually you know claim to be quote unquote skeptics. At this point, they're cranks. Oh, I think there's some honest confusion out there too. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna take you to your least favorite question. How much are you willing to sacrifice to end climate change? At what point do we as a species give up and accept the end? Well, My answer is never. Battle well, over every degree. Well, so what gives you the right to give up? Who said you can give up? If something you can do now will save even one life in five years or 10 years or 100 years, then you should do it. And you know what? Four degrees is better than five degrees, and three degrees is better than four degrees. And at this point, we have actually, we don't know how well we can do. Mm -hmm. I think we haven't even tried. And you've already seen what happens over time is that people are smart. And once we set a goal, we figure out a way to get there. Yeah. So I just think we have no right to give up. And I feel strongly that there are enough options that we can still fix this problem with minimal disruption of human society. There's still going to be damage. There's no escape at this point. But, yeah. uh, but I think we're, we're certainly at a uh, stage where we have a lot of options. And if we decide, we can fix this problem.